thank you very much for inviting me and I will in a way sort of connect to some of the things that uh, Professor Fuller was talking about. Typically, I give talks which give uh, sort of some technical details and sort of historical trajectory of particular theories Then I make in philosophical conclusions and sort of open up debates. This is not that kind of a talk. This is a kind of a grand view of scientific uh, two currents in the way that science uh, has been done in the last, say, 200 years, and a sort of a debate between these two, or sort of a tension between these two uh, versions. So the first, uh, the first uh, notion of toolbox science is really something that you can already see at the level sort of very early on uh, with this division, supposed division between empiricism and uh, uh, rationalism. Uh, it's not as obvious, but it becomes more obvious with, as the time sort of goes on and the, sort of the tra trajectory of, when you look at the details of the uh, uh, trajectory of modern science, so there are things which both uh, empiricists and rationalists would actually take for granted and that slowly turn into something that becomes kind of a generic view of science that I would say dominates uh, nowadays both in the public, among scientists and among philosophers of science. So uh, one thing that's really kind of similar to them uh, is this, that basically science is based as a practice on very versatile conceptual and experimental tools and techniques, right? So they are very different, they are employed in different contexts, and they uh, show the results in terms of prediction and reliability, right? And reliability of manipulation with the uh, natural phenomena, and you have uh, and this is really the main point that I want to stress here. The conceptual tools uh, are always provisional. So these are provisional ontologies. Uh, they're, they're really diverse. They vary. So, for example, and empiricists and rationalists will understand them differently, but nevertheless, they will be provisional. So they're kind of, as in, in like current speak of philosophy of science, they're provisional models of how things look like, right? How the entities, interactions, basic posits of the phenomena that we are studying, uh, and uh, they're replaceable, and really the phenomena will, you know, when you start interacting with them, with the experiments, will kind of show you the way which of these ontologies is correct, right? Whether, you know, it's the waves, whether it's the particles, whether it's, you know, uh, something in between. For empiricists, they will insist that these are idealizations, such as ideal gas, for example. We never really, these are just sort of uh, conceptual prompts to better manipulate phenomena, and they are obviously provisional, but they're also provisional for many, uh, many rationalists to start with because they believe, like Leibniz, for example, in this a posteriori essentialism, that you will, through the process, discover the essential ontology of the phenomena. It's not preordained, it's not a priori. It's replaceable and provisional. This goes for formal tools, too. You can develop your entire science uh, as axiomatics, actually. Uh, and that's what many social sciences did in the 20th century. You don't even need to do experiments. You kind of court the phenomenon through more and more uh, uh, distinct and detailed simulations or models. Uh, this goes from the very beginning for experimentation. Uh, you experiment with the phenomena and you, know, you use very different tools and they are kind of context dependent always. And then finally, the very recent sort of uh, phenomenon in science, modeling and computer simulations that combine all this, right? So the practice of science really went more and more in the direction of epistemic utility. This is how you measure the success of science. Uh, the, the epistemic 
utility, whether you know something with respect to the phenomenon that you can reliably manipulate and predict. That's, that's what's praised about science these days. Philosophically, there was a cost to this because these more uh, stronger versions of rationalism were ditched, basically. Nobody will claim that they can find any feature of the universe or physical world a priori from their chair and say this is for sure the kind of ontological. Very few people will, very few people will claim this. So the uh, a priori insights are sort of sidelined, even if they are in there. So if you want exemplary scientists of this sort, uh, it's mainly people like, you know, Sadiq Carnot uh, or James Watt or Maxwell, those people who are working actually didn't really care that much about the ontological model, what's really behind the phenomena, as long as it had a payoff in terms of the uh, uh, application and a reliable manipulation of phenomena. In modern times, Francis and Crick with their model of the DNA function and the... Uh, uh, sorry, Watson. Uh, Watson. Francis, Francis Crick, Watson Crick. and yeah, Francis and Crick. Francis Crick and uh, Watson, uh, and also, for example, Turing, right? Who is also von Neumann, for example, who were really working on all sorts of phenomena, had breakthroughs in all sorts of different areas uh, with this sort of a mindset in in a way, and this kind of scientific picture is very closely related to the Industrial Revolution. Hence, Watt and you know all these thermodynamics people. Boltzmann is sort of a, you know distinct from this, with the atomic age and also with very specific way of understanding computing that we are dealing with in all sorts of uh, uh, ways nowadays. But there is a very different understanding of science going on in the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. The undercurrent, which is not that visible today, but it's still uh, with us, basically, never really uh, left. And it comes in two guises, German and British romanticism, uh, romantic understanding of science. And it's very different from this toolbox understanding of science. So if you take people like, for example, Goethe or Kant, as Steve was talking about, their sort of a starting point are basically conceptual unities. This is what they think is the proper domain of uh, scientific inquiry. Uh, and it's not only, I mean, so basically scientists are uh, uh, exploring the various unities, conceptual unities, like cosmos and nature, life, and so on, and offering us details, understanding various layers of these unities. Uh, one, so it's, it's sort of a science of big unity concepts, right? Like nature, cosmos, life, and humanity. So you start scientific inquiry from these unities as platforms, basically try to understand the details of them. And they can't even imagine science without this sort of a starting point. Prime example of uh, German Romanticism and the outcome is Alexander von Humboldt, who was basically the most important scientist of the 19th century in the 19th century. Now, we don't think that. Darwin is way more important for us, it seems. But if you ask people in the 19th century, without any doubt, this is the guy. This is the Stephen Hawking of the 19th century. His way of doing science was very particular and very romantic in this sense. He was basically uh, reading Kant and understanding that his mission is to understand, basically, he didn't call it but uh, that way, but biosphere. He circumnavigated the globe to understand the layers of this, climatic layers, different pressure, uh, 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 air pressure at different uh, uh, heights, uh, all sorts of, so the stratification of uh, living, uh, of life, and he wrote the book, I mean, this is his view of the Chimborazo that was thought to be the highest peak at the time that he actually climbed. And he described these little uh, letters are actually different layers of it. And to sort of understand the entire these, uh, 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 ecological niche. And he wrote the book Cosmos, where he tried to put it all together, 
went to the University of Berlin uh, that was set up by his brother, Wilhelm von Humboldt, basically the, the first modern research university. Uh, also, in terms of life, Get and Haeckel have this view as well. And then there are British romantics uh, differently articulating a very similar program. So what you he see here, it's the big glacier in uh, Mont Blanc, the Sea of Ice. All their programs, uh, a number of poets actually were closely tied to the scientists and they are articulated very specific understanding of science, very similar to this German romanticism. People like uh, Wordsworth, people like Col Coleridge, both Shelley's, so they go for pilgrimage uh, in these glaciers. It's called the Sea of Ice, right below the Mont Blanc, very important point. Uh, so their view was that science is there to explain to us our uh, connection with the nature, which is obviously much bigger than us, and to understand actually this kind of human uh, nature interface. And it's sort of a feedback. So I'm in, you know, at awe with the biggest mountain in Europe, and much like sort of Humboldt, was with Chimborazo, I want to understand and I want to use all the scientific means to kind of feedback that knowledge to explain to me uh, what's my place, what's my relationship with nature, with this natural, particular natural phenomenon, with nature itself, with life, with cosmos, and they articulate toward this. And they're really uh, big opponents of the kind of a toolbox science that's uh, emerging. Uh, which is closely tied to the Industrial Revolution. So they're sort of against that very openly. Uh, and uh, in that ser sense, I mean, uh, 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 one way, so you can't actually Whitehead call this prehension of the rom romantic understanding of science, that it starts with this sense of the unity with hu between humans and nature which is supposed to be explained to us, actually. So the unities, this time humanity and nature unity is really the starting point and the target, actually, of scientific inquiry. And they hang out with scientists like Harvey, for example. And if you want really an exemplary sort of a case of a scientist, it's Faraday, actually, who uh, reads Schelling and, you know, romantics, uh, British and German romantics. And when you see his theory, I mean, it turned out to be empirically adequate. And he was experimentalist, you know, with, he didn't know any math. Uh, so his view is he's really trying to explain a, a magnetic and elect uh, uh, electromagnetic sort of phenomena as a unity, a unified force, which is kind of omnipresent in the universe as an electromagnetic field. Uh, with its sort of forces, right? It sounds really sort of borrowed from these romantic kind of understandings. Now, the undercurrent continues, right? It's not visible, so people, some very surprising characters uh, in this vein uh, in the 20th century, the obvious ones uh, after Humboldt are uh, Russian-Ukrainian uh, biologist Vernatsky, who didn't coin the uh, notion of biosphere, but he was the first biologist to describe biosphere as a unit, right? Now it's common understanding, but he was the one who did that, but he wasn't translated in English until the, the end of the 20th century. Now he's older rage among astrobiologists, for example. Uh, or people like Julian Huxley, very, very surprisingly, who understood uh, a Darwinian evolution is embedded in the cosmic evolution as well. Uh, also people like Dobzhansky, but it's more obvious case because the father of uh, uh, population uh, 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 genetics. Uh, then in physics, people like John Wheeler or uh, 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 Bohm, who understood sort of a Wheeler in the sort of a notion uh, of, of cosmological evolution. Uh, as well, I uh, put somebody else there. Yeah, the whole revival of ecological paradigm really is articulated in very similar uh, way. I mean, we should be careful, really, because there is a kind of continuity between the toolbox and the romantic understanding of science. And you look at 
particular characters, you know, they're going to be closer to the romantic or closer to the toolbox uh, science sort of way of understanding science. Uh, like, for example, Humboldt or Julian Huxley. Julian Huxley was actually father of modern synthesis and sort of the role of genetics that uh, plays today. And this also goes for particular scientific fields. So you should take all this with a grain of salt. However, this doesn't really mean that uh, there isn't a split between the two. There is actually institutionally, intellectually, philosophically, and so on. Uh, there's clear difference between the two. Uh, there is this foundational understanding of understanding holes uh, like nature, cosmos, humanity, and so on in romantics that they will not give up, right? That's their platform. They don't exist without... The inquiry of nature doesn't exist without that. There's none of that actually in the toolbox understanding. Also, interestingly, it's very local and parochial, right? Why do you pick particular phenomena and holes as something that defines your scientific inquiry? Uh, whereas uh, the toolbox science is very international, right? And that's why it kind of won, because you have a toolbox that you can take around, you know, and solve, you know, the world problems the way that, you know, you see fit or, you know, your sort of base, uh, political base sees fit. Uh, and it's very easy, we all know, to poke the romantic, you know, deflate romantic balloon. Because you can say, well, uh, the toolbox science is the one which is going to tell you whether these unities you dream about exist or not. You know, like for example in cosmology, there was no, it seems, causal connection between these parts, sort of different parts of the universe because of the inflation. So, you know, there's no... I mean, in terms of life, it's very kind of uh, accidental anyways, contingent. So, you know, it's very easy to, do, to do that kind of move and deflate their big expectations. So, if you look at the sort of a, a heroic phase, uh, 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 Watson and Crick here discovering the function and the structure of the DNA. Uh, they are the typical toolbox scientists doing it. Uh, they do, do the, mo the physical actually modeling here uh, with the ex uh, experimental results that they stole from Rosalind Franklin's uh, lab. Uh, and the ontological part is really, really tenuous and very practical. They're not wedded to it. They're kind of doing the reduction of the inherited characteristics to the molecular uh, characteristics. But very quickly with Jacques and Monod, it was realized that actually there's a regulative feedback. So your ontological tool is completely different. It's kind of like a holistic understanding of the molecular process. Nobody really complains much about it because that's just a dispensable tool like everything else. So really biology is reliable kind of a toolbox for manipulations without any clear foundational commitments. And then you could say, well, you know, uh, the toolbox science seems to have won, right, for all practical purposes. However, if you look at the very early critique, the 19th century critique of precisely this way of doing science, which you can find in uh, Mary Shelley's Dr. Frank, the character of Dr. Frankenstein. He actually, at that sea of ice glacier, there is a big, so this is the monster that you can see, and this is Dr. Frankenstein at that point, actually, uh, right at the big glacier. Uh, the monster gives a speech to Frankenstein, precisely describing how science shouldn't be done, and provides these reasons. So, yes, you are very successful in, you know, tinkering with the phenomena. Uh, and occasionally you find these reliable, reliable ways, but you create monsters, really. You don't know what you created. Your ontology is very provisional. You don't know what you actually created. You don't understand it at all, right? So you basically abdicate it from scientific values of humanity, of understanding nature as a whole, and this is why you created the monster that, you know, you, you successfully uh, manipulated, but you created. This is a very interesting speech that 
that is given there. And this is bound to happen with the toolbox signs. Actually, accidentally, here you can see that at that glacier, the same glacier, it's actually the very same spot where this episode takes place. So this fence here is where the glacier was in 2010. All the way down the stairs here is where it's now, 150 meters below. So, you know, uh, the result of all these, you know, scientific endeavors of toolbox science, like James Watt and, you know, burning of coal and the industrial revolution, you do get these uh, consequences, really. And you are doing that because you don't know how the whole world works, right? You have no idea. Uh, and you didn't take into account things that uh, uh, Vernadsky and James Lovelock of Gaia were actually talking about. So you were just roaming around in the dark and created a monster. That's the early critique of the toolbox science by uh, Mary Shelley. So what's clear is that there are these inherent values, the big concept values inherent to the romantic science, actually as humanity and understanding every phenomenon as kind of a, a, a whole, and then understanding the layers and the details that they are. Uh, so it's actually one way of poking the balloon of the toolbox science by the romantic people. Why? Because they're going to tell them, look, the values, any values, are external to your toolbox science, and that's a problem for you. The only thing you can offer us is sort of talk about the technological offshoots. Oh, you know, our toolbox tinkering created laser or, you know, computer and so on. But really, these are just sort of uh, uh, very kind of external moments to your science. If you want to do the value theory properly, you have to use your toolbox. But if you do that, what happens? You're just doing the applied science like with every other phenomenon, and then you may not like actually the outcome of this, right? Uh, it's very clear these days this is what's going on, and in general, philosoph uh, philosophers of science are confused, right? Because suddenly, uh, it's very legitimate to, to uh, try to do the genetic analysis in racial terms, and you can only stop it if you kind of, you know, step in ideologically into that debate. That's what happens, right? But you open that box uh, with your approach. And this is what happened to one of those guys from the D of the DNA, right? The Watson. He, uh, I mean, this is the title. The DNA pioneer James Watson loses honorary titles of racist comments. Uh, it came uh, basically to uh, haunt him. And the sort of uh, Mary Shelley's critique, you know, she would say, well, you know, it, this is very, very predictable uh, what's going to happen. So I will just give you briefly now the case. So this is the general picture. Uh, one a quick overview uh, uh, regarding modern contemporary cosmology, how this plays Although people, it's not really explicit, but it's there, right? And cosmology will face its moment because it has become big science, whether its funding will be cut or not. Do we really need to look with the James Webb telescope into the dark corners or really deep past or not, right? And there are two questions. What is the social and epistemic value in cosmology, current cosmology? And you're going to get two very different answers depending whether you ask toolbox people or romantic people, right? If you ask, uh, if you ask toolbox people, so what's the value, social value of cosmology, they will go for their usual technological offshoots. But then, you know, if you do the analysis, scientific analysis, there are other disciplines which are way better in technologic producing get technological offshoots. Also, in terms of the, so you should do some kind of a, a much more uh, reductive way of, you know, science, like, uh, you know, biochemistry or something like that, and expect much more payoff. If you ask 
uh, romantic sort of uh, oriented people, they will tell you, well, the value is really this kind of a big platform. We are really talking about the cosmos as kind of unity and uh, this is what we are trying to understand. It's a long-term project and cosmological knowledge that we are gaining is crucial for this, right? The payoff is in that sort of a realm. In terms of the epistemology, epistemological value, the toolbox science will tell you, well, there's very meager evidence compared to, say, particle physics or biology. It's very meager, very uncertain in cosmology with our sort of even best instruments. So the consequence seems to be, well, epistemically, you know, we should put our funding somewhere else. Ian Hacking, for example, claimed that cosmology is not even proper uh, a natural science because it just sort of looks at the past, sort of reconstructs the evidence from the observations. It doesn't do proper experiments. So eventually you're going to be ditched, so to speak. Uh, however, romantics will turn that around. They will say, well, look, your accusation that cosmos as a whole doesn't really uh, come together, doesn't exist, uh, in order to falsify that with your evidence, it's a very long-term project, be precisely because the evidence is very uh, sort of a much weaker, thinner than in some other scientific uh, 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 areas like uh, a particle physics. So you can't prima facie uh, refute our view of cosmos as, as a whole. Uh, and, you know, that's why we should continue actually checking, even on your terms, checking whether it is actually a unified whole. Moreover, and that's kind of the key argument of the romantic sort of understanding of cosmology. Cosmology is really, or physics to cosmology is really in the grand scheme of sort of epistemological scheme of science, what carbon dating is to archeology. span You don't want to do carbon dating for its own sake. I mean, you can, it's useful in some sense, for some, you know, uh, purposes, but really uh, it's a tool actually for this grand project. And physics, looking at the sort of a experimental evidence of uh, a sort of, in, in just sort of a synchronic way, is just a tool to understand cosmos as such. You know, it's very different understanding of uh, uh, the epistemic value of this. But if you want to find out actually about the kind of a prequel to this story, the real history of the last 50 years of uh, cosmology, this is the book that's coming out, uh, The Cosmic Microwave Background, Historical and Philosophical Lessons, written by me and my friend and colleague Milan Cirkovic, coming out with Cambridge University. So yeah, we, 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 we look at the way that cosmology is actually uh, done and I would like to finish with that and uh, <laughs> with uh, Milan's uh, remark on my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment uh, about epistemic value of looking at the past. Uh, I think the, the big body of um, scientific investigation is motivated by looking at the past. Uh, take, for example, historical sciences and, you know, um, looking back to extinction of dinosaurs, we have Alvarez digging uh, iridium and, but also looking back I think life sciences are here maybe a better example. We are looking back to origin of life and we are uh, finding out a lot of stuff about amino acids and whatnot. So um, by uh, uh, interest in the origin of life, we are coming to uh, some knowledge about amino acids and you know, we never know because of holding a protein uh, um, and, you know, knowing stuff about amino acids can cure cancer maybe, and epistemic value, if you look at it that way, is really big. But uh, what's interesting for me is that uh, um, interest in the past, you will never know the epistemic value that will come to today's... Um yeah, one thing which is uh, not really, I mean, inadvertently, Darwin 
was really a champion of this romantic view, I would say. Because before him, people like Kant or Humboldt were very suspicious. They really were uh, uh, excited to understand nature as a whole, but they were suspicious epistemically speaking about looking and making any arguments about the past because we don't have any evidence, right? We don't, we can't do the experiments and like he hacking about, saying about cosmology, it's not real natural science. But Darwin legitimized ironic, well, interestingly, he basically gave a sort of a, offered a, a very sort of a convincing theory based on the fossil record and said, well, we do have evidence actually, if you think about it, for really grand theory about the history of life. And in that sense, that's why Julian Huxley, for example, father of modern uh, uh, synthesis, he took that one step further, two steps further. He sort of tried to unite the Darwinian sort of understanding with the, mod with the uh, genetics and so Mendelian uh, sort of rules. And then he also uh, thought about the evolutionary Cos cosmic evolution as kind of like a larger and sort of a layer in which uh, evolution on, you know, of the biosphere is embedded. So taking historical kind of observational sciences seriously is to a great extent to Darwin. So temporary result was to kind of uh, think that the kind of toolbox science really takes primacy with genetics and the application of genetics, people like Watson and Crick. Uh, but then in the long run, he is part of this sort of a movement to understand science as this kind of a temporal, sort of understand the universe as sort of a temporal uh, whole as well. He didn't really intend that, but. I was wondering uh, in terms of the uh training differences between people who go into romantic versus toolbox science. And what I have in mind here is, uh, so I think about somebody like Gustav Fechner. Okay, so he was somebody who was trained by Schelling, okay, uh, but, event but is nowadays known as being one of the founders of psychophysics, which involved a lot of uh, operationalization of, of all kinds of things. Uh, and. Um, and he's not the only one who kind of went through this kind of educational process in the, uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, and in a sense, the, the, you know, the Humboldtian university of which he was a product, uh, Wilhelm Humboldt, von Humboldt, um, was kind of designed this way, right? So in a sense, somebody like Schelling who would present this very romantic picture with the big concepts and all these things you're talking about uh, was meant to kind of inspire students in terms of you know, undertaking what would be a kind of lifelong career activity, blah, 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 and, and give them that kind of inspiration to, 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 to stick with it, as it were, right? And not just fly off the handle. Be, um, and, and, but most of those guys in that period ended up doing this much more discipline-based work on the back of that, basically operationalizing the big concepts. And so, you know, if you look at the history of psychology today, you know, you, very few of them actually mentioned that Fechner was taught by Schelling, right? Right? It, it, he's presented as a kind of a toolbox guy, you know? And I'm just wondering whether you think there might be something to that kind of educational regime in a way where you start off romantic, you really get the students into science that way to motivate them, uh, but then when it gets down to actually designing the research projects. Uh, yeah, and there are, yeah, there is the opposite effect too. So one is like uh, Vernadsky, Vladimir Vernadsky. He was basically uh, researching minerals and the way that minerals interact with bacteria. And that was the starting, typical sort of a, it's kind of like Planck, you know, yeah. stumbling upon like quantum mechanics, you know, very conservative. And then he understood that the relationship between living, uh, between life and non-living matter is really complex. It's so complex that we need to talk about the biosphere, it, interactions, layers, and he writes the book Biosphere. So how, I mean, it's something to, like a big point for like a liberal kind of education, I would say. 
You never know where it's going to go, not or you, neither you should really know, I would say. You should just open very widely the educational system to different approaches and, you know, let it sort of resolve as it does. Okay, uh, so it's time for a short break, but before we go uh, uh, and have some coffee and refreshments, uh, I uh, just wanted to add something to what you were saying and uh, 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 from the Russian side, uh, Pavel uh, Florensky, uh, in his book, uh, uh, Mysticism and Science, he offered the unit of inquiry, and the unit of inquiry that he offered was a person. Uh, so it's not a cosmos, it's not a, like it's a person. So it's a, uh, from yeah, orthodox the, the Russian so romantics, a, yeah. they have their own sort of version of the romantic science. It was a little late, actually. Yes. And Vernadsky and yeah. all these cosmists were products, yeah. sort of part of that movement, very similar. To 